out of the game. Hi, I'm Kelsa Dickey, the CEO of the Financial Coach Academy and my financial coaching business, Fiscal Fitness Phoenix. My coaching journey began more than a decade ago with me helping people for free from my dining room table. What was once a little business of mine has grown into a seven-figure company that employs a team of people. My goal is simple, to help you fall more and more in love with financial coaching. I believe financial coaching is the most rewarding way to make a living. If you are an aspiring financial coach or have been coaching for years, I'm here to help you create a business you love that gets your clients massive results. Let's get to it. Hey, Coach. Kicking off Episode 71, we are continuing Part three of our series, we have been exploring in this series the various methods, models, and proven techniques that help to make you an incredible coach. These techniques help you to get consistent results with your clients. One of the reasons I love frameworks in general is because they bring structure to a random process, yet still provide flexibility and space for nuance, right? We started this series with episode 69. So to help you frame see what I did there? These concepts. So you understand why we're talking about this and what to do with these tools. Start with episode 69 and 70. Also, I have created a handy cheat sheet for you to both follow along, but also use as a resource and checklist so that you can explore these topics from here. Uh, To download that worksheet or that cheat sheet, go to financialcoachacademy.com forward slash coaching cheat sheet. We are all students of this craft, and I hope that this series has inspired you to continuously learn and grow as a coach. We began the series with four bodies of work or areas of study, each with a handful of tools. Then we moved into more specific coaching models and talked about what each one is and when you might want to employ that particular model. Today, we're going to discuss another segment of your coaching tools, and these are your self-assessment tools. Self-assessment tools are a test, a method, or activity that can help an individual gather information for self-evaluation. There are many of them, and we're going to highlight just a handful today. So this is not an all-inclusive list, but these are probably the most common or popular. In one way, all of the models we've been discussing these past few episodes are self-assessment tools because they help us gather information or gain insights, right? The self-assessment tools that I'm discussing today, however, use psychological or sociological research and focus more so on a person's personality, social habits, strengths, weaknesses, preferences, values, and skills. They're meant to help you understand yourself better, but one thing to note as we explore these is they should never be seen as limitations or as a crutch. Like all of the coaching models we've discussed, you want to think about how or when they can be misapplied. And for self-assessment tools, they're misapplied when the results are used to justify or make excuses for a decision or course of action. So if the results say you're not great at something, the person then says, I can never do that because my blank results said I can't. In other words, we allow them to stereotype us instead of saying, this might be challenging for me because it's not my natural strength, but I can do it anyway. Or I need to create some good habits around this since it's not natural for me. These should be interpreted not as certainties, but more so as likelihoods. Another misapplication of self-assessment tools is when you let them divide versus connect you to others. I think it's important to see differences as beautiful and respect that. And another person's perspective on the world as you know, will probably be different than yours. And I see, again, that is a good thing. In other words, don't let these remove all of your power from who you are, what you're capable of, or how you see others. I'm going to give some examples um, of this throughout as we explore these. Whenever I take these assessments or use one of these tools, there are things I read and I think, oh my gosh, that is so me. And then there are parts I read and I think, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. So just know that like all of the other models I've been sharing, I can see their use and benefits and also their imperfections. In my eyes, that doesn't make them wrong. It's just another reason we want to have a diverse and well-rounded approach to what we do. After we review these, I'll share how I use these particularly in my coaching practice and with clients because it's a little different than the models that I shared uh, in episode 69 and 70 of this series. So in no particular order, let's get started. The first is human design. Human design focuses on how you exert energy, what gives you motivation and how you make decisions that are right and best for you. It's meant to speak to your true essence helps us to better understand our authentic self and how we can live our life accordingly. 
For example, my personal human design tells me that my natural decision-making power comes from my gut or what it calls my sacral energy. And I do find that to be true for me. Ask anyone who knows me and the people on my team. I do consider this one of my strengths, that I can tell quickly when something doesn't feel right to me. Just recently, I was facing a tough decision and my gut was screaming at me that it wasn't the right fit. It doesn't matter what it was. I promise it's not relevant to the story. But logically, I could not find a reason not to do it. And yet I couldn't commit because my gut was full on saying, Kelsa, don't do this. I agonized over the decision for gosh, like two weeks. And finally, Coach Jill on my team, who has known me so well for years, finally says, Kelsa, I have always known you to listen to your gut. Why are you stopping now? And sure enough, it was like, you're right. Logically, I don't need to know why this doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. That is all I need to know. If you go back and listen to episode 67 on sales and how despite all the sales trainings that I took and all the coaches I hired to help me get better in sales, I just kept saying, this doesn't feel right to me. I also think this is a gift that I give to coaches that I mentor, especially in our financial coach mastermind. I help coaches listen to their gut and find their own path and feel good about the decisions they're making and why they're making them, why they're right for them, even if it's slightly different from how I've done something in my business or how another coach in the mastermind is doing it or how another coach that they you know, work with is telling them to do it, but yet they're feeling some resistance on that. Like I can tell you exactly what to do, but if you don't love it, then it is not right for you. The same is true for my clients on the fiscal fitness side of my business. Their buy-in is so important to every decision they make. And I think this comes from honing in on their sacral energy and me helping them to do that. As you might be noticing, human design is a method that is often referred to as a spiritual technique, and yet it doesn't actually have any specific religious dogma or affiliation. There's an app called My Human Design with Jenna Zoe. It's got a peach or a sort of cream colored icon that I really like. So if you want to explore your own human design, I have no affiliation and I am sure there are dozens of probably hundreds of other apps about human design. So this is just the one that I used for a period of time and I really enjoyed it. The next self-assessment tool is uh, Myers-Briggs. This one shows you um, what you tend to focus on and how you respond to conflict. It helps you better understand what really drives, inspires, and worries you and others so that you can build more meaningful relationships. There are five independent spectrums, so to speak, and there are different combinations of those five spectrums. So the result is 16 combinations that determine your personality. This personality type defines your energy, mind, nature, tactics, and identity. I had to look up mine when preparing my notes for this episode, so that tells you how not fixated I am with these, but my personality type is ES. FJ-A. I am known as the console. Here's what that says about me. And I'll let you decide if you think it's accurate. It says attentive and people focused enjoys taking part in their social, excuse me, enjoys taking part in their social community. Achievements are guided by decisive values and they willingly offer guidance to others. I think there might be some validity to that, huh? For ESFJs, it says life is sweetest when it's shared with others. And I do think that that is very true for me. I love engaging with you through email. And someone just said to me, how you find the time and energy to pour into so many people, I'll never know. That was just an email response I got literally in the last week from one of the emails that I spent or sent. And the truth is, Doing that is actually where my energy comes from. But for this person, their Myers-Briggs probably shows a different set of things that drives and inspires them. Not better or worse, just different. You can go to 16personalities.com to take your free assessment and let me know what you get. Next up, we've got the DISC assessment, D-I-S-C. This is a measure of interpersonal behavior, most often used in the workplace, I would say. It classifies how we interact in terms of four personality types, drive, influence, support, and clarity, or sometimes referred to as dominance, influence, steadiness, and conscientiousness. Every person has all four personality types in the DISC profile. It's just a matter of how strong each one shows up for you. I don't even know my disc, 
but I'm sharing it because I know some people love it. And the reason I know that is because I'll have people say to me like, oh my God, you're such a high D. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'm a high D. I don't even know what that means. (laughs) So again, I'm sharing these with you, not because you have to love every single one of them or you have to use every single one of them, but they are out there and they can be informative and uh, helpful for some people. Next up, we've got Strengths Finder. This measures the intensity of your talents and shows you what you do best. It tells you how you are uniquely powerful. That's what it says. It gives you your unique combination of 34 themes, and those 34 themes are then divided into four domains. They describe what you naturally do best and what you might need help from others in order to accomplish. I am not aware of any place where you can take the Strengths Finder. It's also called Clifton Strengths Finder assessment for free. I remember completing this back when I was, you know, in my corporate days, uh, as it does tend to be used mostly in the workplace, but I don't even remember my results. But check it out. Next up, we've got Colby, K-O-L-B-E. Colby measures the instinctive way in which you take action and helps you to better understand and build on your natural strengths. The idea is that if you were left to approach a problem your own way, how would you utilize your affective, cognitive, and cognitive mind to solve the problem and develop solutions? Colby says that creativity isn't a function of right brain versus left brain, but a process that engages all three parts of our brain in unique ways. As somebody who didn't see myself as creative for the longest time, it was the Colby that helped me to really understand how to unleash my creativity or how my creativity is just naturally unleashed. And that for me, creativity shows up very differently than what I imagine creativity to look like in people. This is a method, Colby, that we use quite often on my team, and Michael is certified in this method. Again, you're going to find some methods that resonate more with you than others, and the Colby is simply one that makes total sense to me, and I have found it to be incredibly valuable when it comes to working with clients and coaches. A lot of the mastermind coaches have taken the Colby assessment through Michael, and we have our clients do it as well. In the Ultimate Growth Guide, which you can download at our website, If you go to financialcoachacademy.com forward slash ultimate growth guide, I talk about evaluating a client's prep work. And the example I give is whether they give detailed numbers and answers, or if they use a lot of specificity, or if they give more general responses. This is an example of trying to clue in to a person's Colby so that I can adjust my approach to meeting theirs. If you are interested in knowing your Colby and you want to have an interpretation done, interpretation is like a session that helps you understand the results, you can email us and that is something that Michael does for people all the time. As far as I'm aware, similar to StrengthsFinder, there isn't a way that you can find this out for free. Also, side note, I actually had the pleasure of meeting Kathy Colby, and she actually did the Colby assessment for both of my children. She personally did it. It wasn't like one of her coaches. She herself did it. Um, It has helped us to better understand our children so much. And this is just a personal note. Kathy Colby is someone that I have a lot of respect for. Her body of work is vast. And Someday I hope my body of work resembles or just even comes close to what she has created in her lifetime. So check out the Colby. Next up, The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. This focuses on how you respond to different types of expectations. The four tendencies are upholder, questioner, obliger, obliger, and rebel. This can be helpful to better understand if a client responds better to internal or external expectations. For example, I do not respond well to external accountability. I'm a questioner. So long as I understand why something is right for me, I am more likely to do it. I also have rebel tendencies, which is probably why as soon as someone tells me I can't do something, I want to prove you wrong. And if someone tells me I should do something, I immediately don't want to do that thing. When I hire a coach myself, I tell them that they can't just tell me to go and do something, that they need to tell me why they are recommending that strategy or that approach or giving me that advice and not just why, but why for me specifically. So as you can see, these types of tools can be useful to help you better understand yourself and what we need in order to you know, do the things that we want to do. You can find out more about the four tendencies by going to GretchenRubin.com. That's Gretchen and then Rubin is R-U-B-I-N.com. Next up, we've got the Enneagram. The Enneagram describes nine primary strategies that we use to relate and react to the world. 
each one having a set of basic fears, desires, and generally predictable patterns of behavior. Coach Jacqueline on my team loves the Enneagram, and I have some friends who love it too. Apparently, I'm a three, and I only know that because the people I just mentioned have told me that. Apparently, it's very obvious. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but from what I understand, and again, you can probably tell this isn't one that I've explored too closely myself, but we all emerge from childhood with one of the nine types dominating our personality. I totally believe that our childhoods shape us into who we are, or at least play a very important role. So this idea is summarized into your Enneagram. I won't try and explain the self-assessment tool because there are different centers and we all have wings and you can have two or three wings. I don't know. Listen, clearly, I don't know much about the Enneagram, but if this interests you and it does interest a lot of people, check it out. Uh, I do want to spell Enneagram really quickly for those of you. It is on the cheat sheet, but at E-N-N-E-A-G-R-A-M if you're looking for it. Uh, I won't, like I said, try and explain it in too much detail. It may resonate with you. Don't let my disinterest stop you from geeking out on this or any of the other ones. Please, please, please. Honestly, it's probably my rebel tendencies more than anything because it did seem for a while like everyone was talking about this. So instantly I'm like, yeah, that's a no for me. <laughs> so just realize that, that might be where it's coming from. And now that I realize that I should probably perhaps maybe be more open to it. I asked my friend what a good resource is that I can share with you. And they said the Austin Enneagram podcast, Austin Enneagram podcast. So there you go. Check it out. Just don't tell me I should go listen because that will only make me not want to go listen to it. <laughs> so those are just a handful of helpful self-assessment tools that you can explore. I'm sure there are others. So feel free to share one of your favorites with me if I missed it. Now I want to talk about how to use these in your coaching. With the exception of the Colby, I don't use any of these in my coaching consistently, but they can be fun and insightful and can simply help a client to better understand themselves. So I like to approach it from that perspective. There's this fun tool. Why don't you take the quiz and we'll talk about it. It can be helpful in a number of scenarios. One, if you're struggling to connect with a client, it's a fun way to talk about your similarities and differences as well as get, as get to know each other. And not like in a what's your favorite ice cream flavor kind of question, but like really get to know what makes a person tick or how they see themselves because they'll likely say something like, it said this about me and that's so true. Or I don't know if I see that about myself. I think it's a really good way of sort of deepening a connection if that isn't happening naturally already. Again, I approach these in sort of a fun, silly, let's both do this kind of thing. Number two, if the client is in a bit of a funk, now there's times when the client is really going through something like a divorce, for example, or something big, and that is not what I'm talking about, but just needing maybe some inspiration or sort of a cure for boredom almost. It's like, hey, you can go binge Netflix, which is fine too, or take one of these self-assessment tools and see where it leads. It can be more productive and healthy and can sometimes create a good little spark for somebody. Lastly, we use Colby to better understand our clients and especially during times of career transition or for our business owner clients. We include their assessment and an interpretation with Michael in our program. Not every client will do it though automatically. The coach on our team knows it's an option and knows when to offer it to the client. And then we simply add it as a bonus for them. They don't pay extra for it, but also not every client gets it. So we do treat it as sort of an as needed basis. We used to have every client do their Colby, but we have done so many at this point that we can sort of tell at least generally what someone is so that we can cater our coaching to them at least initially, and then use Colby in a more formal capacity if the situation arises or one of those situations above arises. Now, I will say, if you have a client use any of these, even if for funsies, qualify it. These are not perfect. These are meant to provide insights, but you know you better than any test will ever know you. That is literally what I tell clients. Never assume a client knows that particular part about a self-assessment. They maybe have never even heard of them or to ever taken a single one. And you don't want them to anchor themselves to any result that they end up seeing. Finally, one of the best things that I think you can do with self-assessments is take it for yourself. It helps you to understand your own nuances, which helps you to see the nuances in others. You might learn something about yourself and go, oh yeah, that's totally me. Wait, you mean not everyone is like that? Like it's something that is so natural or ingrained for you that you didn't even realize that you were doing it and that not everyone else thinks about it the same way. 
That's why I wanted to share them as part of our coaching methods series, because they can be useful in understanding just how multidimensional we all are as humans. Some of you probably know this already, but years ago when my daughter Carmen was first born, I experienced a glass ceiling in my business. And the cause of that glass ceiling was a limiting belief I had, which was this belief that if Michael and I made too much money, then our kids would grow up to be spoiled and entitled. It was a subconscious belief initially, but once I realized it, I began to work through it. And Michael and I came to the conclusion that the amount of money we make doesn't determine our kids' values. We determine our children's values. And that led us to asking each other, So what values do we want to raise them with? And that led us to writing out our list of values into something that we call our Dickey family creed, which sounds super fancy, but it's literally just a Google doc with our list of values. And we also created like a printout and framed it for our wall and our house. And it's essentially the values in which we live our life by. Not all of them are relevant to this conversation, but we've been having Uh, that we've been having in the series, but some of them are. So I'm going to share my family creed with you now. Pay attention to the last one and the first one in particular. The first one is we will be in a constant state of evolution, continuously growing our minds and hearts. No wonder I believe in being a student of our craft, right? The second one is we will live with creativity, humility, and in service of others. We will be courteous in word and deed. We will set rules of respect and enforce them relentlessly. We will greet and acknowledge each other and we will use please and thank you because basic courtesies create a tone of warmth and respect. We will address incivility. We will continue to seek joy. And then the last one, we embrace differences as beautiful and seek to not only understand, but to appreciate. Not only is that our Dickey family creed, but also the core values of my company because my work is very much an extension of me and the way I want to live my life and the impact I want to have. I hope any or all of these self-assessment tools and the conversations we've been having help to inspire you to be your unique and most amazing self. I hope you have fun exploring the various coaching methods, models, and techniques that I've provided. And coach, I hope you find joy in being a student of this craft. Please, please, please remember, you don't need to know any of these to help someone. Patiently and joyfully explore these concepts As you continue to help people, don't let not knowing these coaching models stop you from helping someone with their money. Next episode, I'm going to tell you what you need to know about money to be a financial coach. Coaching is all about figuring out what you think of something and how that is impacting how you feel and the actions you take. So I like to end every episode with a question for you to ponder. Uh, It really makes the algorithm gods happy if you leave a rating or a review or a thumbs up. And I would also love to ask you to leave your answer to this uh, question as a comment on YouTube. Uh, Here's your question, coach. How will you begin to explore these techniques, models, and assessments? How can you have fun with this? I believe financial coaching is the best and most rewarding way to make a living. I truly love what I do. If you're ready to learn and see how to become a profitable, successful financial coach, check us out at financialcoachacademy.com to learn more about our online courses, our free trainings, and our events. And if you have any questions for the pod, please go to financialcoachacademy.com forward slash podcast. And I will see you next week, coach. 